University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, we bring together hundreds of multifaceted experts that include world-class bioscientists, engineers, physicians, and computational researchers. This team science approach is designed to ignite creative solutions to the many complex biological challenges facing our families and communities, and has resulted in disease prevention strategies, promising new therapies, innovative diagnostics and devices, and improved food sustainability. Hello, welcome to another episode of Science Talks, a conversation hosted by the University of Arizona's bio Institute. I'm your host, Dr. Brittany Ullorn. Women face unique obstacles when it comes to substance use, misuse, and addiction that are greatly influenced by biological and societal factors. A large aspect affecting a woman's relationship with substances are female reproductive hormones. Today, we're joined by Dr. Alicia Allen, Assistant Professor of Family and Community Medicine, Clinical Translational Sciences, and Public Health. Dr. Allen's research focuses on the intersection of substance misuse and women's health, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about her research to educate and empower women who struggle with substance issues. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Of course, looking forward to our conversation. So as I mentioned, your research focuses on women's health, uh, particularly female reproductive hormones, substance misuse, and addictions. So I find that to be a really interesting and unique combination of subjects. So I'm curious, and I'm sure our listeners are too, um, how did you get interested in studying how hormones and substance use relate? Yeah, so I have to admit it wasn't it wasn't really um, something I sought out to do at the beginning. So it was, but it was very serendipitous. So it was back in, um, I think about 2001, and I was an undergraduate at that time, and I knew I wanted to do research. Um, so I applied for a variety of undergrad research positions and ended up getting um, a job at the Tobacco Use Research Center at the University of, of Minnesota. And um, and I was initially hired just to do some telephone interviews to uh, enroll people in, into the study. And, um, and it was one of those things where the more I learned, the more curious I became. And I just kind of kept doing more and more. And um, yeah, so, so I think it was really that, that job in that moment that got me in. And then I started to see you know, how much application there is and how much of a problem there is, you know, both kind of in the work I do, but also, you know, growing up in a rural area in Minnesota, I could see a lot of, a lot of issues there too. So, so yeah, so that's how I first got started. That is great. I was going to say, I feel like I detected a bit of a, an accent. So I was wondering if you were from Minnesota, but um, yeah, that's so neat how I, I have the same kind of experience where my undergraduate research experience kind of fueled my passion for what I um, studied in grad school and sort of where my interests still lie today. So I think that's neat and it's wonderful when we're able to, you know, give our students opportunities like that to help shape their careers. Yeah, definitely. So I want to take it a step further then and ask you um, what makes you specifically passionate, passionate about supporting women and their health? through your projects? Yeah, um, let's see. Well, I think so. So two of my projects right now focus on, on the perinatal period. And, um, and I, I think that really is a, a passion of mine and focusing on that area. So I, I think it's for two reasons, you know, as a, as a mom myself, um, when I, after I had my son in short, you know, in the early postpartum um, period, I myself suffered with I had postpartum depression and I had some um, feelings of isolation. And I remember at that time very specifically feeling like, uh, you know, there's, I need some more support. And I, I remember going and doing some research about how can I do better with breastfeeding? You know, how can I improve my mood? And as an epidemiologist, of course, I went right to the peer reviewed literature and was really shocked that there really wasn't a lot known. Um, so prior to that, before I became a mom, I, you know, I didn't really, it was harder for me to relate to that. So I focused on more re, women of reproductive age. So, but then after I had my son um, and over the past six years, he's six now, that's really been a goal of mine to focus more on the perinatal period. And I think with issues of substance misuse, it's, it's a really important time to focus on because during pregnancy, there's a reduction in substance use. Oftentimes women will quit using. Um, and 
and there's and that's because they know there's you know the health implications on baby and themselves but also because you know they get more access to health care they get more access to social support in their personal lives you know they have this great motivation to do everything they can to support baby and give baby every opportunity in the world and what happens then in the postpartum, which is really unfortunate, is relapse to substances is extremely high. And I think that's partly because, you know, women like, like me suffer from mood, uh, mood challenges. They may suffer from isolation. Oftentimes, focus goes on to baby instead of mom. You know, we're bringing baby in for lots of uh, checkups with the pediatrician, but mom only gets one. And so, and oftentimes she can't even make that. So it's, it feels like there's this wonderful opportunity where mom is doing everything she can to, to stay abstinent from substances. And then it's almost like forgotten because baby's here. And so I want to do more to help mom, you know, maintain her abstinence or her reduction, because not only is it going to be good for her in the long term, but it's going to be good for her baby, you know, maybe the, even the next generation. So it's just tons of opportunity to, to support people in that time. Um, so yeah, so I just, I think, so that's for the perinatal period. I'll also share for the, for women of non-reproductive age, the reason I'm focused on that is um, what I've learned over the past 20 years is most people think that men are the, are uh, who, when you think of substance use disorders, you think of men, right? So it's, yeah. it is more common in men, but really women are more vulnerable. So if a, a woman experiments with a substance, uh, she's more likely to become um, dependent or addicted to that substance compared to a man. Mm -hmm. And then when she goes in to get treatment and you know, uh, abstain from the substance, she's more likely to relapse to it compared to a man. And so a lot of the medications that are designed to help people, um, stop using a substance are, are designed more to the a male's needs. So that's really what I'm looking for in terms of my work with women of, of reproductive age. And then the focus on reproductive age, like you kind of mentioned it in the introduction, is because we know there's an, an impact of the hormones, right? So it's like figuring out exactly what that impact is and then how we can use that impact to our advantage, both, both during pregnancy and, and not during pregnancy. Well, it sounds like as you mentioned, you know, your projects and your interests, they span so many different ages and stages of um, a woman's life. And so I think they're really impactful. We'll get into those specific projects in a second. But um, when you were talking initially about, you know, your experience postpartum with your son, I think that really resonated a lot with me. As I mentioned before we started this, um, that I have a three month old and you're right, there's that post initial postpartum period is so tough because you were kind of in flight or fight mode, just trying to take care of baby and everybody, you're right, wants to know how's the baby doing, um, but nobody really thinks about mom. And I think even for myself as like a, you know, a pandemic mom, having had my pregnancy and giving birth during COVID-19, it's even more isolating because I can't just go out and hang out with a bunch of um, new moms, even doctor's visits feel very isolating. And so um, for myself, for someone that has dealt with eating disorder and anxiety in the past, um, it has been a challenge to, you know, support myself and maintain my mental health while taking care of this helpless baby. Um, so I think that kind of work that you're doing is especially uh, important. So thank you for having an interest <laughs> in those areas. Yeah, my pleasure. I think, you know, we're not alone. This is our, our stories are, are what most women face. And so they're, you know, we as a kind of community at large need to do more to support moms during that time. Most definitely. Um, so we've touched on a little bit about what you do, but I want to get into it more specifically, more detailed. So you are the director of the Renew team. So Renew stands for Recovery Through Engaging and Empowering Women. So tell us a bit about the goal or the mission of this team or how you even started um, Renew in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like I, I touched upon, um, you know, way back when, when I first started this, the first study I worked on was looking at how menstrual cycle phase uh, impacts smoking cessation outcomes in women. So that, that was really my initial experience with ovarian hormones and how they influence substance taking behavior, um, which is really, really the kind of the foundation of a lot of the work I do. So, um, so when I came to uh, University of Arizona in 2016, um, 
I had a, a fair amount of work done in looking at ovarian hormones and tobacco research, but my, my goal when I came here was to kind of expand it into other substances. So uh, honestly, the first few years, basically what I did was write grant after grant, trying to get, get the grant funding. Um, Sounds and, about right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and lo and behold, that finally, you know, in the past uh, little over a year now is when we finally started to get some grants. Um, so really the, the goal of the Renew team at kind of at large is um, kind of like what we say right on the, on the front of our home, uh, webpage is, you know, we, we as women, probably almost all women out there can uh, relate to the idea of, you know, hearing someone say something like, oh, she's PMSing or, oh, she just had a baby. She's hormonal. You know, we, we have this sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's a very norm where we think these hormones are doing something bad to us. Right. Um, but I, I think, you know, there is a way we can use those hormones to, to help us. So instead of kind of um, viewing them as the problem, I think there's a way we can use those hormones to help us uh, as women avoid, you know, substance use disorders and, and a variety of things. So that's kind of the basic premise of, of the Renew team. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're right. Those kind of phrases about female hormones and our emotions are so common and it's really unfortunate because, you know, we have these hormones for a reason and I think it's wonderful to see the positive side of them um, and kind of empower people with that knowledge and say we can work with our bodies. They're not just working against us at times or they're not just a burden. So I think that's really important. Exactly. Yes. Um, so what are some of the current projects that you have going on right now? Yeah, sure. So um, let's see. So the two, we have two smoking studies. So the first one is, uh, we call it Project Athena, which stands for Administering Therapy and Hormones to End Nicotine Addiction. Um, so this is a pilot study where we're just looking to see if women of reproductive age, if they use Depo-Provera, which is the birth control shot, if they use that, if it'll help them quit smoking. So the premise there is, um, if, if you think about a woman's men menstrual cycle when she's not taking hormones, basically uh, her, her progesterone and estradiol levels kind of go up and down, up and down over the course of the menstrual cycle. Um, and both progesterone and estradiol have been shown to influence sub substance taking behaviors. Um, so, so I kind of thought, you know, maybe what's happening for women um, is, you know, this up and down pattern. So you can imagine like say someone quits smoking and they're feeling pretty good and their hormones happen to be at some certain level. And then, you know, they change and all of a sudden she's not feeling so good. And that continues to happen where you're feeling good, feeling bad. And how tiring is that? You know, like you think you got it, you're like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm quitting smoking. I'm feeling great. And then the next day you wake up and you're back to feeling like you're back to square one. Right. So the premise of, of that one is if we're able to stabilize the hormones for three months using Depo-Provera, maybe that would give her, you know, kind of a level, level playing field, so to speak, to quit smoking. So what Depo does is it basically blocks ovulation for three months. That's how it works to protect against pregnancy. So that's why we're looking to see if, if we can do that, then is that going to help her uh, quit smoking? So this first study is basically just looking at um, are, are women willing and able to use Depo-Provera uh, in a double-blind type study? So, you know, if, if, uh, as some people might know, if typically when a woman gets, uh, has Depo, uh, she, she doesn't get her, her menstrual period. So we want, wondered, you know, like, are we able to even blind them in, this, in a double-blind scenario? Or, or, you know, when she gets her period, is she, is she going to know that she's on the placebo version? Right. Of so those are the types of things we're looking at with Project Athena. So I have a question about this one then, and I'm not sure if you know the answer, but if the idea is, you know, for that three month period, she has the ones that are taking the actual um, Depo-Provera shot, she has more stable levels of hormones and is able to hopefully, you know, stay smoke free. What do you think might happen afterwards? Are you thinking that this is something that might require then additional shots to keep her, um, you know, stop, you know, stopping smoking or is it something that once you've gotten over that like three month hump um she might be good then yeah that's a really great question um and honestly i don't know but what i would what i would suspect at least based on now is um so 
if you think about the actual physical addiction to nicotine, that actually only lasts three days to get over. Um, and so what I would, what I, well, what we are doing in this study, and I think what I would, I would propose in a larger study is to use a nicotine replacement therapy product, like the patch or the nicotine gum or something like that, initially to help with the physical addiction to nicotine. So what will happen then, um, you know, kind of as she uses the patch or whatever it may be, and then eventually stops using it during that three month period, her cravings will um, go from frequent and intense to less frequent and less intense over time. So hopefully by the time she gets to the you know end of that three months, it'll be much less frequent and intense. So she'll kind of already have that leg up. But the other thing that can happen during that three month time and should happen and what we do in our study is some behavioral counseling. So, you know, cigarette smoking and actually probably just about every type of substance use disorder is made up of a, of a physical aspect. So kind of that dependence piece and then also a psychological or behavioral aspect. Um, and with cigarette smoking, you know, that counseling would focus on that, that behavioral aspect. So we would talk about things like, you know, for women, especially avoiding weight gain during quitting is a huge thing. So, you know, what can you do to avoid weight gain during quitting? You know, mood management comes up again here. A lot of times women smoke if, you know, if they're stressed or if they're feeling down, going out to have a smoke break is a common way to kind of manage mood. So maybe we'll talk about how can you do that without smoking? So, you know, during that three month period, hopefully uh, that will provide an opportunity for her to kind of uh, amp up her skills in terms of, you know, what cigarette smoking was doing for her behaviorally before and, you know, figure out what she can do instead, but also buy her uh, kind of some time to get over that physical uh, addiction to nicotine. So, so my hope is that, yeah, just the three month one time injection would be enough, but uh, it remains to be seen. So that'll have to be a future study. Right. No, I mean, it makes sense with what you've said. So hopefully that is the case. Yeah, right. Yes. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Okay, so that is Athena. So what is the next study you've got going on? So the next one is also a cigarette smoking study. And this one is for uh, pregnant women. So we're enrolling uh, women who've quit smoking during pregnancy and want to remain quit after they have baby. And then after they have baby, they get assigned uh, into one of four groups. Um, so it's again, based on hormones. So they, uh, they either get uh, active progesterone or active depo, that's group one, or they get active progesterone placebo depo or placebo depo active progesterone or placebo placebo. So it's similar to project um, Athena in that we're looking to manipulate the natural hormones. And the, again, the, the basic premise here is a little bit different because right after a woman has a baby, she doesn't typically have her menstrual cycle for a little while. But what happens is during pregnancy, her hormones go really high. And then as soon as she has baby, they plummet. And what we're trying to do is after they plummet, sort of modify them in a favorable way. So the research right now suggests that uh, progesterone is protective against drug taking behaviors. So that's why we're giving the exogenous progesterone to try to get that higher. Yeah. Um, and then estrogen is can be, uh, can, can promote drug taking behaviors and the, the depo will, will block that basically. Um, so we start those hormones in the very early postpartum. It depends on each person and how it's going with breastfeeding and that sort of thing, but typically about postpartum day four. And then we follow them all the way through postpartum month, uh, month nine. And what we're measuring is both how mom's doing with uh, maintaining her abstinence. And if she relapsed, we'll provide her support to help her try to quit again. But also we're looking at baby and how baby's doing is, are these, um, are these medications helping baby avoid secondhand smoke exposure and that sort of thing. So, um, so that study is, is, I don't know if I said it, but it's called the, uh, the PEACH project, which, which stands for protecting families by ending addiction to cigarettes with hormones. So that's our, our second study. We just opened an enrollment this this summer. So we'll be enrolling for a couple more years now for that project. How long in general, you said you're, you're going to be enrolling for a couple more years. How long in general do these projects um, take? Yeah, um, well, it depends on pro which project. So Project Athena, we, we since it's a pilot study, it's smaller. So we just had about 
we're going over a little over a year for recruitment for that one. And so then this one, um, the PEACH project is a, a fully powered, we're looking at efficacy trial and it's a partner, we're partnered with the University of Minnesota. So we're doing it at both sites. And we're aiming to get, I believe it's 312 women to complete the study. So, um, so that one is a, it's a five year R01 with about four years dedicated to recruitment. So, so that one, yeah, we're just kind of starting. Um, so then, okay, so you have these two smoking studies, the one with female reproductive age, and then you have the pregnant women. Um, what else? Yeah, so that, yeah, those are our smoking studies. The next one um, uh, is, is the ORCID study. So that one stands for Observing Relationships in Caregiving and Hormones After Infant Delivery. So this one is, um, we are enrolling uh, pregnant women again, uh, either with opioid use disorder or without. And in this study, we're actually not doing any, any intervention, but we're just, um, like, this, like the title suggests, we're just observing. So the women are enrolled in our study and uh, they will do surveys uh, uh, throughout their participation. And then we also collect blood and saliva samples. And basically what we're trying to see is, are there certain um, hormonal patterns or infant caregiving activities that are protective against relapse? And hopefully if we're able to see some sort of signal of that, then what we will go on to do next is design an intervention around that. So it may be like uh, the PEACH project where we give you know, exogenous progesterone and that might help prevent relapse. Right. Um, but honestly, what I'm hoping for is one of the infant caregiving activities, because like how amazing would it be if we could um, protect against opioid relapse if, you know, we simply could recommend, you know, something like do 10 minutes of skin to skin, you know, daily for the first you know, few weeks and that would protect moms against relapse. That would be so amazing. So I'm hopeful we'll see something like that. Uh, yeah, in our that would be really special because that would not just be, you know, wonderful for the preventing relapse, but that's also just a great thing for mom and baby to be bonding. Um, so if you could promote that even more, that would be incredible. I agree. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what we'll find with with those data. Yeah. I'm curious, how um, do you have to control it all if these women for if uh, the circumstances if these women have to have opioids dur during delivery? Yeah, I love that question. So yeah, it's really actually kind of messy. So um, yeah, you know, they're, they're, especially with the hormones. So we're measuring about 30 different kinds of hormones and all of those can be impacted by, you know, other things. So yeah, so like, you know, if, if someone gets induced and has Pitocin during delivery, they're going to have different hormonal patterns. And, you know, and oftentimes if um, someone has a C-section, they might be sent home with an opioid uh, prescription pain medication. So, you know, or even things like, you know, if, if dad is in the room uh, while baby's sleeping, it can impact mom's hormonal pattern. So there's all kinds of different things going on. Um, so it is quite complicated, which is actually one of the, uh, I think, novel things of this study is we're partnering with um, some colleagues at the College of Engineering to do some kind of more fancy analytical approaches. So they're do, doing some predictive analytics where, uh, don't ask me to speak to this in great detail, but what they do is put all the data into their system and um, they can then identify specific patterns in context with all the other data. So it's with, yeah, so I, I think it's going to be really cool. So we'll be able to take that into, into account. And, and, you know, so they're, we know they're living in sort of the real world and their hormones are being influenced. So despite yeah. that, you know, what can we gather from their data? That sounds incredible. I, you're right. I would have no idea how to understand those um, kind of like data analytics. That was not my strong suit, but that's wonderful that they have a process to help you sort through um, all that. Cause it does seem like there are a lot of different influencing factors. I wouldn't even have thought of the um, case of, you know, just the dad being present affecting hormones so much, but yeah, 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 it's really neat. So, and, and, you know, and I, I'm a huge uh, proponent of, you know, transdisciplinary and such collaboration. So that's, you know, it's okay if I don't understand that part, we'll let them deal with that part and, and we'll talk more about the hormone piece of it. So. Yeah, everybody, that's why everybody can be an expert in their own area and then can all, you know, work together on these larger projects to make things happen. Yes, exactly. And then do you have a vaping project? Yeah, oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, so we just have a, it's, um, 
just a one-time cross-sectional anonymous survey that we're doing with vaping. So, um, uh, and, and basically what, there's a couple goals, a couple things we're looking at with it. So we're looking to see if, uh, so it's, it's for women of reproductive age who are not pregnant can do this survey. And we're looking to see uh, if their use of hormonal contraceptives and or what menstrual cycle phase they're in is related to this, their vaping satisfaction. So basically does vaping feel better in one, you know, kind of hormonal profile versus another. Um, but we're also looking at this idea of potentially for our next grant, this idea of uh, menstrual cycle shame. So, you know, some, some people may feel, you know, some shame associated with menstrual cycle. So we have this questionnaire in there that asks things like, you know, do you feel embarrassed when you buy menstrual products at the store? Or would you feel embarrassed if you got menstrual blood on your clothes? Things like that. And then we're going to look to see if they score high on that, meaning they, they feel more shame when with activities like that. Would they be less receptive to a smoking cessation or vaping cessation um, intervention that's timed to the menstrual cycle. But, you know, and so the way, the way we're conceptualizing, like if someone doesn't like their menstrual cycle, doesn't like talking about it, they're probably not going to be real receptive to the idea of, you know, figuring out where in their menstrual cycle would help them quit smoking. Right. So in a grant we're trying to put in, um, which is one of the studies that we completed recently, we're going to look to see if there's a way we can sort of do some health literacy and sort of um, education around the menstrual cycle to maybe reduce the level of shame. So then women would be more receptive to quitting smoking during certain parts of their menstrual cycle. So, so that's the other goal of that project is to kind of just cross-sectionally look at some of those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, and I just think even that education in general would be really beneficial to all women in terms of, you know, their emotions surrounding their menstrual cycle. And I wonder, I'm just curious to see what you find in terms of um, the different ages of your participants. I don't know if maybe the younger um, do feel more shame versus the older women, you know, they've had this for a while and they're kind of over those, you know, feelings of shame and embarrassment, but who knows, it'll be really interesting. And then to see how that relates to vaping and smoking cessation programs. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. But lots of, we just, it was kind of a nice surprise. We used uh, this database. Uh, it's kind of a professional survey panel called Prolific to get those data. And in one weekend, we were pleasantly surprised where we got 555 surveys completed. And so we're, we're, we're the survey's still open. So if anybody out there wants to complete it, we'd love more data, but we were definitely pleasantly surprised that we were able to get, uh, you know, these a lot of responses in one weekend. So now we're actively working to crunch those data and, and uh, do, see how it applies to our future grants. That's great. Um, so for people who are interested in, you know, joining a study or want to take this survey, where can they find that information? I think the, the easiest place and, and for all the studies is to just go to our website, which is renew.arizona.edu. And then right at the top, there's a link that says current studies. And from there, you can kind of poke around and, and see what, what you may be interested in. And then once you click those, you go right over to our REDCap pages, which is where you can um, sign up to learn more about the study. Easy enough. We'll have to I'll link to that um, so anybody can have easy access to those studies and to learn more. Um, so I know you talked about a couple of grants and R1s that you've got in the mix, um, but I know last year you also received the prestigious National Institutes of Health New Innovator Award to um, work on the project that you mentioned about relapse to opioids. So I'm curious, what does this award mean for you in terms of your career development? Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, I have to say, so I feel like for a long time, you know, I've been working, you know, kind of through graduate school and then as an assistant professor, you know, the goal has always been like, get the big grant, right? And then, and then that's what'll lead to you being promoted. Um, and so when I got that, that's, that's, that was my immediate reaction. Like, whew, finally, I got the big grant. So now, you know, I don't have to worry as much, you know, about promotion in 10 years. So that was my immediate response. Um, and I, you know, so that gave me some sense of relief. But after that, then I think, I think what it really will do is it's going to lay this really strong, good foundation for future work. So 
um, kind of like I mentioned, or maybe I didn't, uh, there's, there really are no relapse prevention programs for opioid use disorder in the postpartum. Oh, no, period. you didn't mention that. Oh, yeah. So it's, I mean, so, you know, there's the clinical recommendations right now call for, you know, use of medication assisted therapy, such as methadone or suboxone, mm -hmm. um, along with behavioral counseling, but kind of at a <clears throat> bigger, <clears throat> excuse me, population level, there are not relapse prevention programs. So, you know, we don't know how, what more to do. So if, so I think that that is a huge untapped territory. So with this with this grant, um, the way, like I mentioned the ORCID study, which is going to give us tons of data to, to figure out what we can do next. But the way the grant is set up is they, they give you all the money up front. So you can do kind of whatever you want with it, depending on what your research shows. So it's, it's nice in that we're getting the strong foundation, but then after we get those data, then we can we can do some interesting things yet to be determined. So, um, so yeah, so I think it kind of gives me, you know, more security and confidence in kind of my career trajectory, but also in the actual research where we're going to have this great foundation and, and be able to, you know, jump on whatever the data suggests we should do right away. So it's very exciting. Yeah, most definitely. There's a lot of potential there. So congratulations on your award. Thank you. So just last question to wrap us up. Um, as a parent myself, a new mom, I know finding time for just establishing a good work-life balance can be challenging at times. So I'm curious how you support yourself and have a good um, or hopefully a good work-life balance. Yeah, this is a good question. I, I would have a much better answer if it was pre-pandemic, but you know, <laughs> during pandemic is a different story. But you know, I will say, I guess two things. Um, the first is if, if your listeners don't know about the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, um, check it out. So the University of Arizona is a, an institutional member, which means their programs are free for us at the university. And it, I've done their, their, I think it's called a faculty boot camp, um, but I did their, that twice. And then they also have an alum, alumni program. But basically what that teaches you to do is to how to use your time most efficiently and also in a way that supports your long-term goal. Mm -hmm. So, so the, I think that is a huge helpful training. And the way, my second point is kind of coming right from that. So I'm a big, um, advocate of and, and on a, admittedly a big dork about uh, strategic planning. So I'm, I'm very strategic in what I do. You know, every year I set out my goals and then I break it down to the month. And then every, you know, either Friday or Sunday evening, depending on how the week goes, I plan out, you know, what, how I'm spending all of my time and I stick to that. So, you know, uh, that, what that does is allows me to keep my evenings open. And I, I rarely, with the exception of planning my week, work on the weekend. So I think it's really important both for, you know, my family and having family time to have that, but also just, you know, my brain to kind of turn off that worker side and just go and do some fun stuff or whatever it may be. So I, I think ultimately, you know, the bottom line is really, I'm really uh, conscious and diligent in terms of how I use my time. So I get those, that downtime. Yeah, I think that's important to really establish those boundaries um, and to know this is my time that I am dedicating to work and this is the time that I am not working um, and to stick to that uh, so that you can, like you said, support yourself, um, but also be able to have a great time with your family and those that you care about. So yeah. I think we can all implement a little more strategic planning in our lives. We'll have to take a page out of your book. <laughs> Yes, and feel free to hit me up for tips on that. I, that's one of those things I could talk about all day. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm sure people will reach out to you for some help on, on help planning out their week and their month and their year, um, especially with January right around the corner. So right, exactly. Yeah, now's a good time to do it. So yeah, yeah. it'll be here before we know it. My goodness. Right. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for joining us today. I really loved hearing about your research, where your passion stems from. Um, I think it, it really resonated with me, and I'm sure it will resonate a lot with our listeners. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was definitely my pleasure. So uh, thanks again.
You're welcome. And thank you to our listeners for joining us for another episode of Science Talks. For more information about the Bio5 Institute, please visit our website at bio5.org. And from all of us at Bio5, we will see you in the next episode. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of Science Talks. Continue the conversation with us next time as we learn more about the amazing science happening at the University of Arizona's Bio5 Institute.